Um, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, so I, I wrote a book a while ago called uh, Alternative Medicine on Trial. Um, but as, as you've heard, it was me that ended up being on trial as well. Um, before I get to that, I, I should explain my background's really in maths and physics. I've written about medicine here, but my background's in maths and physics. Uh, I've written books about codes, for example. I'll tell you very briefly about one of the codes I've written about. Uh, it's called the Bible Code. And um, the idea of the Bible Code, it's a very odd idea, is that there are messages encrypted in the Bible. Um, the way they're encrypted, uh, I'll explain to you now. Um, you get rid of all the punctuation, you get rid of all the spaces, so you just have a string of letters. Um, you start somewhere, so I'll start with the first letter, and I'll jump five spaces. That's not a word, so I'll start somewhere else. Um, that's not a word. I'll read it backwards, it's still not a word. But the really bizarre thing is if you do this with the most ancient Hebrew texts, you find messages. For example, uh, uh, here's, uh, here you find words like Hitler, evil man, slaughter, Nazi enemy. Um, to die, President Kennedy in Dallas. Um, I, I, I mean, this is real. This is you can't deny this doesn't exist. You even find the name of the assassin, uh, Oswald. Physics is even there. Newton crosses with gravity. Um, and this, this is a book by Michael Jolson. I flashed it up a second ago. It sold millions of copies, and everything in it is true. Uh, now, one mathematician, a guy called Brendan Mackay, said maybe this is just a coincidence. Maybe you'll find these messages in any book. Uh, Drosden said, if you think you're so clever, find messages in, actually, Moby Dick. He challenged him to find messages in Moby Dick. So Mackay did exactly the same thing. Got rid of the punctuation, got rid of the spaces, uh, had a string of letters, and would look for letters equally spaced in a straight line. Exactly the same algorithm. And this is what he found. Trotsky, uh, <laughs> who was killed with an ice pick. And an ice pick is a steel head of a, a lance or a hammer. Um, and in fact... If you do this with Moby Dick, you find predictions. You find, in fact, over 200 predictions. You find as many predictions in Moby Dick as you do in the Bible. Um, and, and this is one of the things I like to look at, is coincidences. What's a coincidence and, and, and what's a meaningful correlation? Um, coincidences are all around us. This is my favorite coincidence. Uh, to be or not to be, one of Shakespeare's most famous lines. Um, if you rearrange this, this very famous line uh, from Hamlet, of course, you get the following anagram. Um, in one of the bard's best thought of tragedies, our assistant hero Hamlet queries on two fronts about how life turns rotten. Um, so, so you can either think, how weird is it? How weird is it? Shakespeare wasn't just a great writer, but he was a great puzzler. How weird is that? Of, co of course, there's nothing weird about this. He just wrote so much stuff that eventually this is bound to happen. Um, the only weird thing is that somebody found this. That's the only weird thing. But, um, so, but, but the thing is that people still believe in this. So the great thing um, is, you know, this is from Bible Code 2. It's all about the events of 9-11. Um, the great thing is that our hero, Brendan Mackay, continues to debunk it by finding messages in Moby Dick. Um, this is a huge prediction. There are so many predictions in this text from Moby Dick. I'll, I'll show you them one at a time. They all relate to the death of Diana, somebody whose life is foolishly wasted in an accident involving power velocity. Uh, what we find is whales running down the, or the cross. Uh, Diana running backwards, um, Lady Diana running down the middle. Um, how did she die? Well, it was a tragic skid on a road. Um, the name of the driver you may have forgotten was Henri Paul, um, and the other person in the car, of course, was Dodie, 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 Dodie. Um, all encrypted in Moby Dick. So um, that's what I kind of write about: is is codes, puzzles, mathematics, and science. Um, and I got interested in in alternative medicine. Um, it was a bit of an odd thing. I, just, I was just worried about the, the claims that were being made for alternative medicine. Um, I, I, in fact, I, I'd heard that young people, students on their gap years, were going off to tropical countries and using homeopathy to protect themselves uh, against malaria. And I couldn't believe this was happening. So I asked a young student to visit 10 homeopaths, and she said, I'm going to West Africa, where you can be dead in three days. The, the strains of malaria are so severe. And she said, uh, I, I want to use something instead of conventional treatment. And 10 out of 10 homeopaths were willing to let her go abroad with just sugar pills to protect herself. Um, and I thought, well, this is really dangerous. There's so much misinformation about alternative medicine. It's clearly not all rubbish, but some of it is rubbish. And we should use scientific research to tell the difference between the good and the bad. And so uh, I teamed up with uh, Edzard Ernst, who's a, the world's first professor of complementary medicine. And we, we wrote a book about what works, what doesn't work, what's safe and what's dangerous. And when you write a book like this, you, uh, you know, we looked at, at, at homeopathy and acupuncture and herbal medicine, and, and we looked at chiropractic as well. And when you write a book like this, 
you want people to know about it. So you give talks, you give interviews, and you write articles. So um, I wrote an article about chiropractic for The Guardian. Um, so this was just two and a half years ago. And um, I said, well, first of all, what is chiropractic? You know, in case people don't know about it, it's spinal manipulation. Um, and, uh, you know, if you see an iridologist, they'll look at your eyes. If you see a reflexologist, they'll look at your feet. If you visit a chiropractor, they'll look at your spine. And, of course, they fix back problems. So, you know, that's not, no big surprise. Their evidence base isn't great, but, you know, everybody struggles to fix back problems. So they do as well or as badly as anybody else. Um, however, there are risks, as with any medical intervention. Um, some of the risks are very rare, but very, very dangerous. Um, other risks are much more common, such as stiffness and bruising, and, and less dangerous. Um, but the thing that got me into trouble was the fact that half of the chiropractors in Britain claim to treat children for conditions like ear infections, asthma, and colic. And I just found this baffling. How on earth can somebody claim to cure these conditions by spinal manipulation when there doesn't seem to be an obvious link with the spine and when the evidence just isn't there to justify such treatments? Um, now, just to take a step back in history, why on earth would a chiropractor make this kind of claim? Well, this is the inventor of chiropractic, a guy called Daniel Palmer. And when he invented chiropractic 120 years ago or so, um, it, it was a panacea. He, the first person he cured had profound deafness. He manipulated their spine, they could hear again. The second person he cured, as, as, as far as he claimed, was, uh, had, had a serious heart condition. He manipulated their spine, their heart condition improved. And he believed he could cure everything because the spine carries a nervous system through to the rest of the body, if you're sick, according to his theory, it's because the nervous system is being blocked in the spine. So realign the spine, and the innate energy, which is what he called it, would flow again through the nervous system, and the body would heal itself. Um, so, the, so chiropractic wasn't about manipulating the spine to fix the spine. It was about manipulating the spine to fix the entire body. And so you find adverts in the 20th century, um, things like this one. Um, chiropractic, uh, adjust the cause of disease. Um, this one says, if you are afflicted in any way, look up the chiropractor. Uh, this one's a bit more modern. Uh, there are very few diseases, as they are understood today, which are not treatable by the chiropractic method. Uh, right up to this kind of thing you find on the internet today. So chiropractors have had a fantastic, uh, fantastically ambitious claim for their medicine. Um, and, and so in light of that, it's not so odd that today we find chiropractors who make these children's claims for asthma and colic and ear infections. And I'd say about half the chiropractors in the UK claim to treat these conditions. So it's nowhere near as bad in terms of their ambition as it was 20, 30, 50, 100 years ago. But to me, this is still ridiculous. And in the article I said, you know, parents should not take their children to go and see chiropractors for these conditions because the evidence doesn't stack up. And I don't think the professional bodies of chiropractors should be promoting these treatments. Uh, I mentioned the British Chiropractic Association has over 1,000 members, and they seem to promote these treatments on their website. I said that wasn't a good thing to do, and um, they sued me for libel. Um, and that's where the story kind of starts. Um, the case went on for two years, and my case um, is long and it's complicated, and I'll race through it very, very quickly. But the thing I need to stress is that my case is very, very far from unique. In the last week, I've heard of four libel cases involving scientists. Um, one I can't tell you about. Um, one involves the RSPB being sued for libel, for criticizing some methodology of a research project, and the researchers are now suing the RSPB. Um, one is about a, a doctor who's criticizing a cosmetic cream which is supposed to increase bus size. Um, and she said, look, I don't see the evidence it works, and if it does work the way you say it works, it could be dangerous. She's been threatened with a libel action. Um, an organization called Sense About Science tried to highlight this problem, and lawyers called them and threatened them as well. Um, a guy called Peter Wilmshurst, who you may have heard of, was being sued for libel for questioning the uh, efficacy of a, of a new heart device. Uh, that case has been going on for two years. Uh, he gave an interview to the BBC Today programme about this libel action. And the BBC was so worried that they pre-recorded the interview and ran it past their lawyers, ran it past Peter Wilmshurst's lawyers, and uh, now P 
Peter Wilmshurst is being sued a second time for that interview, which as far as I can see, there is nothing wrong with it whatsoever. Um, there's another case as well, which I can't tell you about, um, but there's a lot of it about. I say, if it was just me being sued for libel, and if it were just scientists as well, um, this is a massive, massive problem. And this is why it's a problem. Um, so I wrote the article, I wrote the article for The Guardian. Uh, I'll just briefly take you through my story, then I'll briefly take you through the problems, and I'll tell you briefly how we're going to change the law. Um, um, so I was sued for libel. Uh, I wrote the article in April. I got the libel threat in May. Uh, the BCA was suing me personally. The British Chiropractic Association was suing me personally. In libel, you can sue the publisher, you can sue the distributor, you can sue the online server, but you can also sue the author, of course. And they sued me personally. So I ran to the Guardian office. I said, you know, I'm being sued for libel. You know, wh wh what are we going to do? And they said, not so quick with the we. And they... Um, <laughs> and, um, in fact, initially, they were quite helpful. They're helpful in as much as they would do anything they possibly could to get rid of the libel suit. They said, we'll print a clarification. The BCA said, no, that's not good enough. They said, we'll print, uh, we'll give you 400 words. Simon says, you've got no good evidence. You show us the good evidence, we'll print it, whatever you want. They said, no. The Guardian even offered to apologize. And the BCA said, no, we don't want the Guardian to, apolo Guardian to apologize, we want Simon to apologize. And I can't apologize for something which I think is true. So uh, at that point, the Guardian backed away. And, and I kind of understand their position because the Guardian at that time were being sued by Elton John, they were being sued by Tesco's, and they were being sued by a vitamin salesman <laughs> who was promoting the use of vitamins to treat HIV in South Africa. Um, absurdly dangerous, the, the third one. Um, ben Goldacre was sued, and uh, along with the Guardian. Uh, and the Guardian actually won that case in as much as the vitamins promoter dropped the case. Um, but the Guardian ran up bills of half a million pounds to defend that libel action. And of course, if you win, you get some of the money back. Uh, but the Guardian are still £175,000 out of pocket. So the next time somebody wants to uh, write about uh, vitamins being used for some treatment in, in, in Africa, um, and the Guardian think, well, it's going to cost us £175,000 even if we're right then The Guardian or any other newspaper is maybe less likely to run that story because of the horrendous expense of our libel laws. Um, my case went on, it went on for two years. Um, I, I'm not going to go into it in any detail because I say it's, it's about many, many other cases. It went on for two years. It, sometimes it looked like I was going to lose. Um, towards the end, it looked like I was going to win, so the British Chiropractic Association dropped the case. Um, but it went on for two years, and it was two of the most miserable years I've ever had. It was really horrible. Uh, but three good things came out of it. Um, one good thing that came out of it was I became a father. Uh, my, my wife is here, and we argue greatly about whether he looks more like me or looks more like her. Um, I think he looks more like me, but I'll, I'll let you judge. Um, here he is. There you go. Oh, you probably can't see. He's got my glasses on there, actually. You probably can't see very well. Um, then um, another good thing that came out of it is people scrutinized chiropractic. They said, you know, what's this thing that, that, that uh, there's a libel case over? So the BMJ commissioned an article about chiropractic, does it work? Uh, and they commissioned an article about critiquing the evidence. And the editor of the BMJ uh, put forward all the evidence, uh, the for and against. And Fiona Godley, the editor of the BMJ, her decision was readers can decide for themselves whether or not they're convinced. Edzard Ernst is not. His demolition of the 18 references is, to my mind, complete. So for the first time, I think doctors were beginning to be aware of some of the outrageous claims of chiropractic and were seeing that the so-called evidence was incredibly flimsy. So that was a good thing that came out of it. But the best thing that came out of it um, was a, a libel reform campaign. Um, as I say, not solely out of my case. One case isn't important, but Ben's case... Peter Wilmshurst's case and many other cases, there is a real campaign for libel reform. Um, why do people need to reform the libel laws? What's so terrible about the libel laws? Well, in two minutes, um, I can tell you, um, it's incredibly one-sided. It's so easy to bring a libel suit. You, it's assumed that the claimant has an impeccable reputation. Um, it's assumed that there's been damage done. So it's easy to bring a libel suit. It's incredibly hard to defend. Um, the, you're, you're guilty until you can prove your innocence. There's no robust public interest defense, as there is in America, as there is in Australia and Canada. Also, in those countries, and in America and Australia in particular, large companies can't sue and bully individual authors. And when I say authors, I mean authors of books, journalists, bloggers, academic journals, scientists, uh, human rights groups and charities and so on. 
So in Britain, this is the place you want to sue. Not just if you're British and you're threatening or trying to silence a critic who's also British, but if you're from anywhere else in the world. So we have this wonderful phenomenon known as libel tourism, where you get Ukrainian oligarchs suing Ukrainian newspapers in London. Not because our laws are so wonderful, but because our laws are so anti-free anti speech, so hostile to writers. You end up with Icelandic banks suing Danish newspapers in London. You end up with Saudi petrobillionaires suing uh, American authors in London. Um, there was a case of a, a woman, Rachel Ehrenfeldt, who was sued by uh, uh, Bin Mahfouz, this, the Saudi petrobillionaire. And you think, well, why can he sue an American in London? Well, you need two things. The claimant needs to have a reputation in London and the, uh, the material needs to be read in London. Now, if you're a billionaire, you will have property interests, you will have business interests, you'll have shares in London. So every billionaire can sue in London if they want to. And the, uh, the internet and, the, uh, and Amazon and so on means that virtually everything can be read here in England. And because of Amazon, Rachel Ehrenfeldt sold many, many, uh, sold many, many books here in London. I think a total of 23 were established. But that was enough for her to be sued and for her, for her book to be pulped. So there's a real pressure to change the law. The good news is that uh, lots of people are backing the campaign, including the government, uh, the coalition government. Before the election, every single party uh, had libel reform in their manifesto. Um, we've, we've had over 50,000 people signing the petition. Uh, there's been a working group. Uh, this is my son again, Harry. <laughs> Keep libel laws out of science, as little uh, baby Gro says. Uh, even he's back in the campaign. So um, I'll leave you with this. Please, please, if you're uh, an author or if you care about free speech or if you read, frankly, um, either way around, it's not just about my right to write what I think is important, but it's about your right to read the full story. Um, if you care about these issues, then uh, please do sign up. The government is committed to reform. Um, how far they'll go in their reform will depend on how many people um, stand up for free speech in this country. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.